Heavenly Father, as we uh, bow before you this morning, we pray that uh, the message that uh, you have for us will be one which will be uplifting, which will help us also to uh, take care in certain things which will become obvious as we speak. And we ask that you will be with us and bless us uh, through this Sabbath uh, day and into the coming week. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this is always my, this is my common preliminary slide. So it says if you can read this, you have 2020 vision. If you can read the next slide now, you have prophetic vision. I think I've had that in every talk I've ever taken in this church. Um, the sword of the Lord. Um, swords are interesting things because throughout most of history, swords have been seen as part of battle scenes and of destruction, of killing and so on. Um, and so they were designed to be. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the sword of the Lord and the sword of the Lord actually comes from the scripture back in the Old Testament, which we'll come to in the story of Gideon. We'd also... Um, like to point out that many swords, in fact most swords, have two edges. The reason why they had two edges was that you could cut both ways. But the problem with um, something that you can cut both ways is you can cut yourself as well. Swords in the time of the Crusades, for the Crusaders, were shaped like a cross. And in fact when a crusader was about to die it was not uncommon for them to hold the sword like a cross believing that that would save them um, the enemy the opposition were from the islamic faith and their swords were not shaped like a cross the sword itself was actually curved like the curve of the moon which is the symbol of islam and the part that protected the hand was also curved uh, in the same way, a little bit like a sabre that um, sometimes you can see in pirate-type things. Um, so, the sword of the Lord. A little bit of background to this story. We're going to talk initially, in fact, mainly about the story of Gideon. And most of you know this story, I'm sure, um, but the actual timeline of this has uh, got some interest. So here's a timeline we have on the screen here. Uh, with starts with the beginning of the move of the children of Israel from Egypt, the start of the Exodus. Now, this date has been debated a little bit, but we'll look at it and say that it was about 1446 BC. Um, and there was a time, of course, that they were in the wilderness, so 40 years on. And so if we move on a little bit from there, we come to the time when they had conquered the land of Palestine and Joshua uh, passed away in uh, roughly 1381 BC, it is thought. And then if we fast forward now some uh, 100 odd years, uh, we find the time when uh, there were judges following uh, Gideon um, uh, sorry, following uh, Joshua, there were a number of judges and by the time, between the time of a, about 1204 and 1144 BC, uh, there was a judge of Israel who was a woman, unique, never seemed to happen before or since. But Deborah was a very interesting person. And in the time of uh, Deborah judging Israel, Israel was in all sorts of trouble from their enemies. Uh, and this story of Gideon defeating the enemies is part of our story today. And just to put this in a little bit of context, we can see where King David's reign was sometime after that. So this is the timeline we're talking about. And Deborah, the first and only female judge of the children of Israel, lived at the same time as Gideon. Now, she probably was a judge in the more southern part of uh, the land of Canaan, of Israel, and uh, Gideon lived in the northern area of Israel. Deborah wasn't only a judge. She was a prophetess, a leader, and a composer of songs. In fact, um, there is a song in, in the scripture which uh, um, theologians have had a lot of trouble trying to 
decipher exactly what the message was, but uh, she did compose songs. During her leadership, Sisera, the famed captain of the Hazarite army, was defeated by Barak, um, and, uh, who was the Israelite, and then Sisera himself, a great general, was actually assassinated by a woman. And that was the worst possible thing that could happen to a soldier, to be killed by a woman in those days. Okay, now this is maybe particularly for the young people. We're going to go on a plane journey from here to the land where this uh, action occurred. And so we follow our plane. And I don't know that this sort of plane journey happens directly like this, but um, if you could possibly land in this place, you would end up in what's called the Valley of Jezreel. And I'm sure our pastor has probably been there. Yep. <laughs> um, and this is in the land of Israel. Now, at the time of the Judges, in Judges 6, you might like to look this up in your Bibles, beginning with verse 1. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, it wasn't the first time they'd done evil in the sight of the Lord. It seemed to be a recurring theme. They would do evil, they would then repent, they would have a good leader and they would come back to the Lord and then they would do evil again. And as a result, the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian. Now, we know that the Midianites were a wandering uh, nation who moved around, marauded, and uh, took um, spoil from wherever they could. And they were in the hands of the Midianites for seven years. Um, um, the Midianites of, of that time, most of them, not perhaps all of them, but most of them, were worshippers of idols, the goddess Hathor and the goddess Ashtoreth, or Astarte, as she was known. These were basically like fertility symbols, these goddesses. Um, and uh, there was a lot of immorality associated with their worship. So let's read Judges 6, 1, 2 and verses 3 to 10. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, that is, sown their crops, the Midianites would come up, also the Amalekites, another nation uh, of... Um, aggressive people in the area, and the people of the east would come up against them. So the Midianites and the Amalekites came from the east and moved westward into Israel. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. Now we know that Gaza is way down in the south of Israel. And leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites and the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. A condemnation from the Lord. This uh, map you can see there shows um, where some of the judges of Israel were uh, living at these times. And here we have another map and it's showing uh, also places where people lived. And you can see up there, if you can read it, it might be a little bit, oh, I think you can probably see up there Gideon um, up in the north. And the Midianites and the Amalekites would come in. They largely rode on camels. Now, camels are an interesting beast because they are significantly higher, as you can see in this uh, graphic here, than a horse. So you have an advantage of height in a battle. Um, now, they are notoriously also difficult to ride, but um, it would appear 
that they had an advantage over even uh, horse-ridden uh, warriors. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves and the strongholds which are in the mountains. Now, there's still these caves and, and strongholds, a lot of them are still there. And I'm not sure if our pastor has visited any of these. This is a famous one. This is a cave of Adullam where David hid with his men. And that you can see where that is by the arrow. It's down toward the south, opposite the Dead Sea, uh, but more towards the Mediterranean coast. And here's another one, the Bell Cave, Bet Shemesh it's called, Bet Shemesh. Um, some of these caves were actually dug out by the people. They were actually manufactured, if you like. Um, they weren't natural caves, or they took a natural cave and expanded it so they could hide. That's how bad it was um, in those days. Now, the story goes on that the angel of the Lord came and sat under a terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, in the north again, which belonged to Joash the Ab Ezrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. So, in order to keep just a little bit of food, they'd have to be very careful. They would thresh their grain hidden down, uh, if they could, in an area where it wouldn't be very obvious, and this was in the wine press. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valour. Now, that might have surprised Gideon because he didn't think he was a mighty man of valour. He was just a young man and he was hiding from the enemy. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Now, have you ever actually thought that way? Have you had a disaster or a problem in your life and you've thought to yourself, Lord, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to my family? You know, we've seen tragedies happen all with great regularity, haven't we? Innocent people being injured or killed. We see it in the news every day. We even hear of tragedies amongst our own people. And we think, why, Lord, has this happened? to this person or that person or to my family or to me. And this is the way Gideon was thinking. Why, Lord, has this happened? Now, Gideon probably knew the answer, my guess, because he knew what had been going on. In fact, his father had even set up a statue or set up an idol to one of these gods in their own property. Gideon said, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? So here he's harking back to what the Lord had promised. But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So here he was, a young man, and later on when we hear the story of David, very similar story. David, the youngest, not a great soldier, it would appear like his brothers, and yet God chose the one that appeared to be the weakest. God knows best. But here Gideon is giving some excuses. Now excuses, we can see stories of excuses in the Bible, can't we? You remember when Moses was confronted by the burning bush and the Lord said, well, I want you to go and bring my people out of Egypt. All Moses could think of was excuses. Moses said, O oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Excuses. Excuses don't wash with God. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? To Moses. 
And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a servant, a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Not exactly the strong soldier man that, or leader that you expect. But the Lord had indicated that Moses was the chosen one. And so was Gideon. So back to the story of Gideon. The Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If now I have found favour in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. Um, remember, he's talking to an angel. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. Now here Gideon is asking for a sign that this angel is actually an angel of the Lord. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now you would think that would be enough, wouldn't you? I mean, if that happened to you, wouldn't you be fairly well impressed <laughs> that this was the angel of the Lord? However... It wasn't quite enough for Gideon, but we'll come to that in a minute. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. Did he do it in the middle of the day? No, not quite. Gideon's courage was still pretty low and so he waited till it was dark because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day and he did it by night. That's in verse 27. Was God testing Gideon? Well, I think that's pretty obvious that God was testing Gideon, but this was a reciprocal thing because Gideon was trying to also test God. Then all the Midianites and Amalekites and the people of the east gathered together and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. Um, now, that's the place that I showed you where our aeroplane supposedly landed, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet and the Abiezrites gathered behind him. This is his own tribe gathered behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to, messengers to Asher, Zebulun and Naphtali and they came up to meet him. So a lot of the northern tribes gathered together to meet Gideon. And oh, I'll go back there because there is a map there, uh, which is going to take a little while to come up. Um, the map is showing you where these different tribes were. I've got a, a black line around these tribes. So this is the, these are the northern tribes of Israel. Then the, all the Midianites and the Malachites, the people of the east, gathered together and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. So here is being set up the battleground. Now, the Valley of Jezreel is an interesting place. Um, if you were to go there today, you would see, and you'll see in, in a minute a picture of it, it's actually a fertile valley where they grow lots of crops. This is a, a map of the area, and you notice I've circled in the middle there, and I hope you can read that. That says Megiddo. Oh, that's an interesting name, Megiddo. Do we find that in Scripture? This is the Valley of Jezreel today. 
you can see that there's a, what looks like about a six lane highway passing around and uh, lots of fertile fields. It wasn't like that in those days, but it was still very fertile. Where do we see Megiddo coming up again? If you've got your Bibles, you can turn or read from the screen, Revelation 16, 13 to 16, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go um, out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Now, Armageddon was historically located and called Megiddo, um, the place where we're talking about. But this is way back in the past. And this text, of course, is referring to the future. But the battle of Armageddon is not like the battle that Gideon had to fight. The battle of Armageddon is a spiritual war. It's a war between, between the forces of evil Satan and those of Christ, uh, of right and of righteousness. The battle of Armageddon is a spiritual war and as a result, the destruction of the world by fire comes afterwards. Back to the story of Gideon. Gideon said to God, now Gideon has already been given a lot of evidence that God was with him, but I don't know about the personality of Gideon. He really wanted to be absolutely 110% sure that God was with him. He said, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a, a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early in the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, the and he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowlful of water. Well, no, he's already had fire eat up the sacrifice. Um, now he's had this second proof that it was God calling him, still not satisfied. Boy, this guy really is a bit of a cynic, isn't he? Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. Three proofs that God was leading. Surely that's going to be enough for Gideon. Was God right to test Gideon? Question to ask yourself. Was Gideon right to test God? And how far should you go in testing God? Maybe sometimes you've had in your experience times when you tested God, when you said to God, look, if this will happen, then I will do this. Or if something else will happen, I will do that. Uh, maybe, but what if it doesn't happen? Does that mean that you start to lose faith in God? Or maybe it doesn't happen when you want it to. Or maybe it happens in a different way from what you wanted it to. Who knows better, you or God? That's the question. Then Jerubbabel, now that's the other name for Gideon, by the way. They give him two names in the scripture. And all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harod. Now the well of Harod is part of, it's, um, in part of that valley which is right about there, it's called Ein Harod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. So that's a little bit up there. And they were coming down, as it were, from the mountains into the valley. By the way, you'll notice a little bit north of there, there's a very um, important town called Nazareth. So now you can locate this from the time of Jesus. This is south 
of where Jesus lived. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. This uh, took me back a little bit to the lesson this week when Abraham um, was, uh, took the spoils from the kings that he'd defeated and uh, he, um, he gave it all away, except what he'd already given tithe of it, but the rest he gave away. And the kings who were receiving this, the king of Sob, said, no, 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 you keep some for yourself. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to keep some for myself because then you will start to say, it is you who have defeated the enemy, not God. So Abraham gave it all away. And here, God is testing uh, the people by saying, if you were to defeat the enemy by your thousands, you would then say, it is us who has won the battle. So I'm going to test you now. And so he said, Therefore proclaim in the hearing the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Now 10,000 is still a pretty decent sized army, but it was nowhere near the size of the Midianites' army. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. Now there is a stream that runs through the valley and ends up going into the Mediterranean. And the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart for himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. So, for the children, who are the ones who were going to be the men in the army? Those who leaned down and drank like a dog or those who lap with their hands? Who's going to tell me? Ha! <laughs> There's a child over there. He's a bit of an old child. <laughs> know the answer. Thank you. Um, and the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men only. Originally 30,000, then 10,000, now 300? This doesn't sound like, from a worldly point of view, um, a good idea. What army would reduce itself to the size of 300 and take on what could be 100,000? Ooh, it must be beginning to be a bit worrying for the children of Israel. Now, a little digression. Um, this is Lord Baden-Powell. He was the founder of the scouting movement. And not only was he the founder of the scouting movement, he was the founder of a very famous, famous phrase, um, which was the motto of the scouting movement. Uh, in Scouting for Boys, which was published in 1908, Baden-Powell wrote that to be prepared means you are always in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. That's a pretty good sort of a philosophy, isn't it? Um, if we apply that to the Christian life, it, it has a, another meaning, another level of meaning. And in fact, if you saw the badge that the scouts wore, underneath they had their motto, be prepared. In fact, um, in my own career and times when I was uh, doing surgery, um, we used to use this um, phrase, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And that's very true. And God knows all about preparation because God sends 300 men into battle against what must have been a horde of an army, but they were prepared. Brings back another story about preparation, doesn't it? Which Christ told about the ten virgins. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins 
who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. In what way were they wise and in what way were the others foolish? The wise were prepared, the foolish were not. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So we go back to the story of Gideon. But if you were afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura. Now, here, God is giving another sign to Gideon that he was with them. And so he goes down to the camp in the dead of night um, and sneaks through very quietly and hides behind a rock. And when I say the camp, I mean the camp of the Midianites. And the Midianites were probably having a bit of time together and talking. And so he went down with Pura, his servant, just two of them, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp, the camp of the Midianites. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. This is the enemy talking. This is the enemy saying, we are going to be defeated. Now, that's number four <laughs> proof that God was with them. How much more proof did he need? At least he didn't ask for any more. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. Now, this is the first time that we see that Gideon actually worshipped. Now, he probably had worshipped before, but he finally gets down on his knees and thanks the Lord for the directions that he was given. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet and I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. I'm glad he put it in that order the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Because really, it was the sword of the Lord. And what happened? Well, we know that they 300 went down. They were hidden. Everything was dark. Then suddenly they broke their uh, pictures. The lights encircled part of the camp of the Midianites. They blew their trumpets. It sounded like a massive army coming. And the Midianites panicked and they ran and they actually started to attack each other because they wasn't sure who was the enemy and who wasn't. In those days, there were no uniforms of armies and in the dark, it'd be quite difficult to tell who was your, who was your enemy and, or who was not. And as a result, there was total confusion. Three companies blew the trumpets, broke the pitches and they actually began to pursue the army of the Midianites for quite a long way. Uh, the army fled to Beth Akakia towards Zerarah as far as the border of Abel Meholah by Tabath. Now, I'm not quite sure where all they were, but I think it was, up, it was back to where they came from, so to the east and also to the north. This should have been the start of a glorious recommitment of Israel to worship God. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you think that such a unbelievably unlikely victory, 300 men against many, many thousands, should have been a rejoicing of the children of Israel in the Lord? Because they knew that it was not the strength of 300 men that had defeated the enemy, they knew that it only could have been God, no one else. Did that happen? 
Instead, unfortunately, it was the start of the rot. Now, we know that Israel went through these periods of of great uh, following of the Lord and later on they would apostatize. And so we had for a while a wonderful time and then all of a sudden things began to go bad again. And in the scripture we find this word, uh, this phrase, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And that's what happens when the leadership goes wrong. And there's this saying, an English proverb, it's said, but it probably goes back a lot earlier than any English proverb. It says, a fish always rots from the head down. And of course, if Gideon was to go wrong, then the rot would begin. And unfortunately, that's what happened. And how did it happen? Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give me the earrings from this plunder, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Okay, so they even in those days put golden circlets around the necks of their camels um, because these were, these were things they had plundered. They had taken gold from many places, including Israel. So Gideon asked for the gold. Now, the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold beside the crescent ornaments, pendants and purple robes which were on the kings of Midian besides the chains that were around their camels' necks. And these, these are actually, uh, this photograph here, is ac- are actually gold um, artefacts that were found in Israel. And at today's value, that was well over a million dollars worth of gold that he asked for. A million dollars worth. Not bad. What did he do with it? Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city, Ophrah. Now, you remember the ephod was a garment worn by the high priest and it wasn't solid gold. It was a material and, of course, it had some precious and semi-precious stones on it, uh, and it was specifically designed by God to represent a number of different things, one of which was um, that God would indicate through the high priest his approval or disapproval of any course of action by highlighting one or other of stones on uh, on the breastplate, the ephod. So what Gideon was doing was setting up an idol. And not only that, it was an alternative to the real ephod. So idol worship is always an alternative to the worship of God, is it not? And here he is setting up something that would perhaps attract people to think, oh, well, this is probably part of the worship of God. But it wasn't. And all Israel played the harlot with it there, meaning that they came and worshipped at this ephod. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubbaal, that's Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. So not only was it a, a snare to the whole of Israel, but it also was a snare to Gideon and his household as well. It was not appreciated what he had done, and it shouldn't have been for what he had done, but it led to big problems. The men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. Here was one of the first requests of the children of Israel to have a king. Interestingly, um, Gideon didn't become a king, but it began a rot process, if we could call it that, which ended with the choice of a king in Israel some many years later. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you. At least he was right there. Nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So at least Gideon got that bit right. 
Now, just fast forward to around 160 years from this time. This is uh, the time of Samuel. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. Remember, they said to Samuel, give us a king. And Samuel said, no, the Lord does not want you to have a king over you. But if you do choose a king, this is what will happen. Taxes, conscription, He will take your lands from you. Um, He will oppress you. But they still wanted a king. So if we go back to the time of uh, Gideon again, Midian was subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted their heads no more and the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. But it didn't do them any good spiritually really. He had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. Not sure the Lord approved of that either. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Zerubbabel, Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. As soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal beareth their God. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubbabel in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. One of Gideon's sons by a concubine, Abimelech, killed all his brothers and set himself up as king of Israel. Now, you all thought that Saul was the first king of Israel, didn't you? (laughs) Well, this chap was king for a very short period. I'm not sure how long, but um, it was uh, three years according to the scripture. He set himself up. Now, whether he was king over the entire 12 tribes or just the north, we're not quite sure. And exactly what claim he had to be king, we're not quite sure. But interestingly enough, like Sisera before him, he was killed by a woman who saw him coming, didn't like him at all, pushed a millstone off the top of the um, parapet of the city and hit him and he died. So... Do we have some lessons from the story of Gideon? You know, often we've looked at the story of Gideon and said, well, this is a wonderful story about God leading the children of Israel, as it was. But there are also some parts of this story that are important for us to take home as lessons. Here's one. When you cry out to God, he responds. Not always immediately. When you test God, he will respond, but in his own way. So Gideon would have probably preferred an army of maybe 30,000 than an army of 300. But God said, no, we're going to do it my way. Take care what you ask God for. And that's something that we should always remember, you can ask God for something that God is not happy that you should receive. When you commit to God, he will test you. And that's quite true. Um, It happens, of course, when we're baptised, we know that is a testing time. After you're baptised, the devil does not like that at all. And he will test you. And God will also test you. The devil will test you in this direction. God will test you in another direction. Now, another one here, and this is, I think, very important for our young people. Very important for our young people. No matter how much good you've done before, a single bad decision can ruin the rest of of your life. I'll say it again. No matter how much good you've done before, a single bad decision can ruin the rest of your life. Now I'd like to turn that round a bit. A single good decision can bless the rest of your life. 
And I think that's the take home message that we should keep. The good decision to follow the Lord will bless you for the rest of your life. Thank you. We'll just have a word of prayer to close. Heavenly Father, decisions are so important. The decisions we make from day to day, sometimes trivial, sometimes more important, can lead us down one pathway or another. Not only that, we can go down the right pathway and still end up in the wrong pathway if we make decisions on the way that are not right. So Lord, we plead with you that you will lead us in the paths of righteousness, as it says in the scripture, for your name's sake. That the decisions that we make throughout life, whenever it is in life, whether early or later, will always be ones that you have approved and that you have led us to. So we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide and lead us day by day, both individually and as a church, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.